<laughs> okay. A um, little bit we sort of briefly touched on in question time. The uh, I'm going to make a mess of your uh, video, but... Right, it's happening over here, good stuff. Uh, a little bit about the evolution of bees, I've put a question mark behind there because um, I'm not sure that we uh, are 100% certain about the evolution of bees. So there's probably some conjecture, and we've got to remember that um, because we, we, we're, we're dealing with um, uh, animal tissue, but uh, the fossil records are actually quite quite sparse. Um, but it seems that bees spread from Africa in some way. How they got there, we're not quite sure whether they, uh, they started there or they moved from the uh, Near East, which now seems to be, the, um, as I understand it, the, uh, uh, the, the main suggestion. They then spread in different directions uh, as expanding species uh, would. Um, and they became isolated by natural barriers, which could have been perhaps mountains, um, uh, sand, water, ice, or, or, or whatever. And there they developed into the subspecies um, that we know today, and their characteristics developed um, to uh, suit the environment that they found themselves in. So let's look at some of the common examples I think there's some might be something wrong with this here, but let's um, see how we go. Let's look at some of the common examples, so perhaps we can understand why bees perhaps behave slightly differently. Let's look at Italians first, uh, because worldwide they're probably the most uh, common. Um, they found themselves in the North Mediterranean, and quite a small area really, but um, their climate was warm and predictable, with long summers and short winters. And I spoke at the beekeepers from Tuscany, and uh, their bees are, um, are bringing in reasonable or good quantities of nectar for 10 months of the year, which is a little bit annoying, I find. Uh, so uh, they have a long forage period. Um, so they decided that it would be very prolific um, well, the queens would be very prolific, so build up huge colonies. That's fine, because there's plenty of bees to go out and get whatever forage um, that there is. Um, we know that they need an awful lot more food. Just observation shows you that. Um, Cooper suggests that um, they need two and a half times the amount of food over our native bees, or compared to our native bees, just for maintenance purposes. So just to keep them going uh, throughout the year. And then carniolans, which we briefly mentioned before lunch, are very closely related. If you look on a map, they come from a, a, an area only a few hundred miles to the east. But the conditions there are quite different. So, uh, Eastern Europe, um, where they have long cold winters and short warm summers. Um, they tend to come from uh, sort of alpine areas uh, quite a bit. Of course, we all know what alpine summers are like. Of course, there's plenty of forage for a short period. So how they evolved was to winter in small clusters to presumably conserve what food they had, build up very, very quickly in spring so that you got um, uh, a big uh, summer forage force. So the queens then became very, very prolific in, in the summer. Um, I don't know why, but I suspect it's to cover for heavy winter or heavy natural winter losses that they swarm like crazy. And anyone who's had anything to do with Carney Islands will tell you that. Sometimes it's sort of a job to keep in the hive. Um, and then our native honeybee, which is now universally known as the North, uh, uh, the dark northern uh, European honeybee. Um, is native to the whole of the area north of the Alps and Pyrenees, right out to the Atlantic seaboard in the west, the Urals to the right, and as far north as bees would survive naturally. So it had to be um, uh, way below the uh, tree line for obvious reasons. So what they find themselves um, with is uh, long winters with cool, unpredictable summers, and that's the key, cool, 
unpredictable and very often our bees can go uh, to sometimes three weeks um, where they found forage. So conditions are variable and that is uh, considered to be the reason why our native bees are more adaptable than any of the other species. <laughs> So they decided that they would be uh, non prolific uh, and to compensate, the bees would live longer. And if you think about it, it takes exactly the same uh, amount of food and effort to get a bee from egg to emergence, or foraging for that matter, um, however long it lived in the, um, uh, in the adult stage. So anything you can get in the adult stage, of course, is going to be a, a benefit. Uh, and that probably one of the reasons why if you look at a, a colony with non prolific queen um, you very often think there's a lot of bees in there and it's simply because I think they, they, they live longer. Um, they are pretty frugal um, and they've got several techniques that they use, one of which is queens going off lay during the summer when there's, um, uh, when there's a shortage of, of food. They tend to fly at low temperatures, both workers, uh, drones and queens, might think, well, what's the point of that? But if you think about it seriously, uh, certainly during the winter, if the uh, workers fly at lower temperatures, they can go out on cleansing flights, where perhaps some of the others might stay at home and um, uh, defecate within the hive and possibly um, uh, uh, spread uh, nosema at, at, at a higher rate. Um, the drones and queens, we are fairly certain, although I've never ever seen any figures, we're fairly certain that they, um, they mate at lower temperatures. And certainly some of the places uh, I'm involved with, um, like perhaps the Orkneys, where everything sometimes can be horizontal for a, uh, for a month, um, they don't, as you know, wind, uh, uh, wind, rain, sleet, snow and all the rest of it, even during the summer. Um, they don't have the problems of uh, getting queens mated that we, we do on the mainland. Then there's buckfast. I've got to mention buckfast because they are becoming um, uh, more popular. I've got to say they're not a breed and it's a surprising number of beekeepers who seem to think they're a breed, they're not. What are they genetically? I have absolutely no idea. Um, Different so-called buckfast, they're all sorts of things. Some are straight hybrids, some are a bit of this, a bit of that, a bit of something else. Somebody's, uh, somebody's shaking their head and somebody's nodding their head. So. Uh, from what I see of them, they are very, very variable. Just have a look at um, buckfast breeders' websites and you can see, even in one photograph, you see bees are all different within the same photograph. Seems to me there's no stability uh, amongst them. What I do know is that wherever I go, they seem to get the blame for the next generation being uh, bad tempered, and uh, that seems to be quite a universal thing. Now, I've never used them myself, but I have handled bees on many occasions. I've been told to buck fast for the next generation, and um, uh, they can be quite, quite bad tempered. Now, the key is, of course, um, uh, to keep them uh, the same, you've got to keep buying uh, the queens. And that, of course, is why Brother Adam kept an abbey going for so long. Um, uh, and that, of course, is unsustainable. Yes, there are people on peninsulas and places like that which are keeping whatever they've got um, fairly pure, but that's, that's, that's about it. Now there may well be people who disagree with that and let's have a discussion. <coughs> so our native bee, it's evolved to suit their climate. Um, I think they're easy to manage. I've handled them um, uh, on many occasions and the, the real pure ones really are a, a joy to handle. But there again, so are pure carnivores um, and pure um, uh, Italians. They're nice and cheap to run, so you haven't got to keep um, uh, buying more loads of sugar. So, although we may not have them, uh, we can select for their characteristics. And that's what I've done in uh, uh, Sussex. I guess some of you folk further north may well have some that are 
uh, fairly pure. <coughs> or it really don't make too much about that. What I do know is there was a Colos uh, study, um, and the report was it's in 2014. Um, it was a study that was done between 2009 and 2012. Now, Colos is uh, an organisation of international uh, bee researchers. And what they did was um, they compared uh, different bees in different uh, places. There were 21 locations throughout Europe where they had uh, done these um, experiments, where in each case they took the local strain, whatever that was, and two foreign origins. <coughs> so overall, it was in 11 countries, 621 colonies altogether, and what they were trying to do was to um, see which performed the best. And in every case, the locally adapted bee, whatever that was, performed the uh, best in all cases. Uh, which, if you come to think about it, is what bees have been telling us for 40 or 60 million years, or, or however they've been in existence. Now, feral colonies, um, they're the ones that are either in trees or buildings or something like that. Over 55 years of keeping bees, I've removed uh, many of them. Only a couple of weeks ago, um, I took one out of a, a, a massive oak tree. Um, I probably removed several hundred, certainly two, three, might even be approaching 400. Many of them pre varroa and th uh, bees very definitely behaving differently since varroa has arrived than before. Um, pre varroa I'm pretty certain some of those wild colonies were there for a long time. So they just kept going and going and going. Now if they've been established for any length of time, they tended to have the characteristics of our native bee. Even though the colour might not be um, uh, always dark, some of them, certainly the workers, would be maybe uh, quite light. They were usually uh, non-prolific, presumably because the cavities available to them may not have been big enough for them to, produce, uh, to provide e enough space for uh, over overwintering. Queens are usually darkish, and that told me something. Um, presumably because yellow ones, in my experience, are more prolific. And I, I doubt if you get the bright yellow queens in this area, certainly in other parts of the country, uh, you do, they tend to be of New Zealand or, or Australian um, I I Italians. They simply do not survive. Despite what you may read, I've always found that they're, they're, they're very healthy. Uh, I've never ever seen one of the foul broods or, or other foul broods in uh, the wild colony. Uh, chalk brood always seems to be at a very, very low level. So I suspect, and I don't know, I suspect with if a colony is uh, 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 um, uh, subject to a chalk brood, uh, there may well be some other weakness to it, and nature will just take it out. But I, but I don't know. It would be interesting if somebody could do some work on that. So they were survivors. The exotic types I've told you don't live very long. It really is natural selection. That tells me something. But most of us have moments, I suspect. I think they can be improved, which we've already uh, discussed. Perhaps we can, together, um, perhaps form a little group, or perhaps a, a local beekeeping association um, can do an extension of their teaching apiary. It may not be the apiary manager's job, perhaps they can sort of subcontract out to somebody else. You know, you, you get involved with it the uh, Queen Mary or, or, or whatever. And I'm sure much speaking association will be able to find somebody who can help. All I can ask is please, please, please don't parachute Queen's in because at the end of the day it's not going to do um, uh, any good. All the, to the best of my knowledge, all the five national beekeeping associations, so England, Scotland, Wales, Ulster and um, uh, Ireland, Southern Ireland, They've all got a policy of non-importation. Well, but all I'm suggesting is use what suits your area, whatever that is, and please raise your own points. Nice and easy, we'll show you how to do it. So, how do I select breeding 
and um, coal. Well, it's a bit, um, uh, it's a bit simple, not scientific at all. And some of the geneticists amongst us will probably have a bit of a laugh about this, but it works for me. Um, you folk can do the same. So all I do is <laughs> I take my colonies, how many I've got, and split them into two roughly equal groups. It's only a mental thing, it's not that lot there and that lot there. <coughs> I call them group A, they're the ones that are the, the, the better ones, that have got the characteristics that, um, that I want, or larger characteristics I want. And I'm raising queens from within that group and, and, and using them. And I'm not replacing queens unless there's something uh, wrong with the queen, perhaps she's, uh, she's up to fail or something like that. And then we've got group B, so this is the 50% that um, uh, are less desirable. And I'm constantly re requeening them, perhaps um, once a year, sometimes it might be twice a year, it depends what, um, what the situation is. So it doesn't matter how many colonies you've got, whether it's just two, perhaps like that, or perhaps you've got eight, or perhaps um, a bigger group, bigger individual uh, beekeeper, or um, a group, or perhaps a local beekeeping association, it doesn't really matter. And then when, you get the, when I get the opportunity, um, just raise queens from um, uh, one colony, not the same one all the time, I very rarely get two batches from the same queen. And then I requeen some of those in the bee group, not all of them, some of them, and then when the queens get mated, if I find one in B group that's better than one in A group, they get swapped over. And my simple mind um, uh, works out that uh, that way you can improve your bees quite some um, uh, quite significantly, although um, I'm sure, as I said, the geneticists will um, uh, uh, pick holes in that. Then try it again. So it's as simple as that. Um, and I'm sure everyone, low, um, you know, or all we can do it. Now, to produce queens, we clearly need queen cells, because then I'll have uh, useful bits of kit. So queen cells in. Personally, I don't think they're understood anywhere near enough. So what do you folks do when you see queen cells? I think I heard it. <laughs> That's what usually happens, isn't it? Um, but why? Why do people panic? Because I think they could be great opportunities. They could be Either they can provide you either with genetic material or the situation to put genetic material in. So don't start panicking, think about it right from the start. Think as positive from beekeeping. So natural queen cells then, we've got um, we got them, we got them built, or well, the bees build them under three impulses. Small cells, which is uh, colony reproduction. Emergency cells where the queen goes absent, which I have to say in a natural state, I've never seen. Take a natural colony, uh, I've never ever seen evidence of emergency cells. And supersedure cells, which is um, where you get queen replacement. So effectively the same thing, but for three very different reasons. Sadly, proud upon my son, uh, and I've absolutely no idea because sometimes you get um, a, a speaker who will tell you not to use uh, swarm cells or emergency cells or whatever and then tell you to, how to do an artificial swarm and I really don't understand it but that sort of thing happens but bees have been using them for millions of years millions of years and all of a sudden we come in and say oh no 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 that's not good but I wouldn't mind betting that if we analyse all your colonies, probably 75%-ish of queens come from natural cells, queen cells, in one way or another. Think about it. So, let's find out a bit about them. 
Look, you reckon you can all recognise emergency suit procedure and swarm cells if you saw them in a colony? I don't mean swarm cells just because they're supposed to be around the side of the frame and on the bottom and supersede your cells on the face. I don't mean that. I mean actually looking at the, the number of cells, where they are, um, and um, the state of the colony. Now, can you do it? Have a look on Cushman's website, that's the easiest, the easiest way. There, 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 are, there, there are ways to tell. You need to understand that bees will swarm on all kinds of queen cells, even though they may not be built by the bees for swarming purposes, if the colony is in the right condition and the weather is fine, even if they're um, emergency cells or supersedure cells, the chances are, like 80% in my experience, will, will, will go out. So don't think they can't spawn um, on um, on emergency and supersedure cells. <laughs> I mentioned two leaving two queen cells this morning. This is something that's come into beekeeping probably in the last 15 or perhaps 20 years. And the thinking is that if you leave two queen cells, if something happens to one, you've always got the other one as an, as an insurance. Uh, have you all heard that? Do you believe it? No. Why not? Because you try it and you swarm go out. Um, right, what usually happens is if the colony's in the right condition and the weather's fine, the first one to emerge will go out with a swarm. If you don't believe me, leave two queen cells and see what happens. Now, worse still, how long does it take a colony of bees to detect that a queen cell is dud? Five, six, seven days. You can tell that quite easily because uh, they then it then takes them a long time to start chewing it down and getting rid of the uh, uh, getting rid of the contents. On several occasions, I've had uh, uh, two queen cells uh, left. The bees have swarmed with, with the first one to emerge and, the, the, and left the double one behind. Right? And if you don't believe me, you keep two queen cells, you make sure you go on your local association swarm list. So when somebody within a mile of you says they've got bees in their chimney, you can sort it out, because the chances are they come from yours. Okay? So, don't, don't fall by that one, because you, 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 you'll trip over whatever happens. We're also told that they should be left unsealed. Why left unsealed? Because sealed ones could be dud. But hang on a minute. What about the unsealed ones in two or three days' time? They could also be dug, couldn't they? But there is a reason. Um, sometimes when they emerge, down comes the lid, out comes the queen, what happens? Worker inside, clean out the residual royal jelly, and bees have got a bit of mischief, haven't they? So what do they do? Close up the lid. That's it, we've all been fooled. Uh, so that's one good reason perhaps for leaving them unsealed, but all you need to do is just touch the end of the cell with a, your, or a high tool or something like that, and um, uh, if it's emerged, it, the, uh, the, the tip will come off. If not, it will stay there firm. So that's one thing you can do. The other thing is, of course, with a, a, um, a natural queen cell, you don't always know the age of them in a couple of days or so, um, so perhaps if you leave them, you could end up with them um, emerging before um, uh, before you expect them to. So what it does do is give you extra time. Now we all know that um, our queen cells are sealed uh, for seven days. So if you leave an unsealed one and you're a weekend beekeeper, uh, if you leave it on, on, let's say, the Saturday, unsealed, you know that when you go next Saturday, the Queen shouldn't have emerged, shouldn't have emerged. So it does give you time. So there is good reason for leaving it unsealed, but not the reasons that we usually get. You need to know one or two things, and one of the most useful things 
is the more queen cells that are built at the point of swarming, usually the more swarming the colony is. So if you get two colonies side by side, one's put up, let's say, eight or ten queen cells at the point of swarming. So when the first one is about to be sealed, and the other one's put up 40, the one that's put up 40 is going to be much more swarmy than the, um, uh, than the other one. So if, uh, if they were both put up at the same time, don't think, oh, all those queen cells have got oops, because what we'll probably find is that you've got quite a swarm economy. Use the other one. Um, I used to reckon 18 was my dividing line. More than that, I wouldn't use. I'm having a problem with this over here. Um, uh, more than that, I wouldn't use. Um, less, uh, I would. Um, now it's down about 10 or 12, because I've improved the swarmability of my bees. Um, from what he used to. I think it's okay now, man. So, emergency cells, these are the ones that are built on uh, worker larva. So, usually when the queen goes uh, missing, all the bees think that they are queenless. Personally, I think they're badly misunderstood. Now, we know they prefer to build them on new comb or the edge of comb. So, perhaps if you've got a uh, uh, some, some of the um, uh, comb is fairly old, others is new, other is new. It's the new comb they're more than likely to build the emergency cells on, or perhaps the end of the comb. So, what happens when a queen is removed? Yeah, I think so. Yeah. Ian, it might be the presenter that's wobbling a bit, not the microphone. <laughs> Can you look up, Roger? The glare from the top of your head is actually affecting the video. <laughs> Not always the same. Some are 
almost undetectable as queenless. Other bees I've seen have been absolutely frantic in a couple of hours. And I've seen uh, colonies, uh, okay, single group home colonies with no, um, uh, no supers on. I've actually seen bees running around on the roof, presumably looking for, for, for their queen. I guess some of you on the weekends have as well. It doesn't happen very often, but um, they, they do seem to do it occasionally. Now, when do they start emergency cells? How many hours later? Uh, I've done a little bit of work on this, and it does vary. But interestingly, about um, five years ago, I suppose, at the BBKA Spring Convention, uh, I was just looking on the BBKA stand of some of the old past papers, exam papers, and this to be a question. How long does it um, take a colony to start building emergency cells? Well, I've done a bit of work on it, and there were two people on the BBKA stand, and um, I, I just asked them, uh, and they were both on the exam board, uh, one of them didn't even say uh, good morning, good afternoon, or whatever it was, it just disappeared into the distance. <laughs> and the other one said, well, I don't know, I didn't set the question. <laughs> uh, which probably tells you a little bit about the exam board, perhaps. But um, I try to explain what I've had, what I've seen, and you can check this out yourself. It's quite a difficult experiment to do, but some colonies, um, within about 12 hours, you can see that they're, they're starting to build emergency cells. Others I've found, two days later, like 48 hours, and they haven't even started. So there's something uh, going on, perhaps with the pheromones, and um, I don't I don't understand why. Uh, all I know is there's certainly a day and a half uh, difference, um, and I don't know the reason. And it would be interesting to know what the answer was going to be in the module, because I think it's something that big guys should know. But um, I really don't know how, how long it takes them. Right. Now, what I found was that the bees stagger them over three to four days. And we're told that they, they build them all together and the reason that some get sealed before others is because the bees build on um, uh, older larva. Yeah. Check them out. Check them out. Have a look in there. See when you just get the little puddle of raw jelly. Have a look at the size of the um, larva and I bet you'll find that the, the larva are actually small. Not large as we're told. Anyway. Yeah, they usually use uh, lava. Right. Now what happens is we're very often sold to, to, to cut the uh, seal, the older ones, out at this point. So what happens is, think about it, the bees usually build more. So perhaps if you've got 15 in there and you take 10 out, the bees tend to build roughly the same number. So let's say another 10. Right, now all of these are getting older. They're all getting older. So what happens? The bees start them all together. And they're the ones they all start together, not as what I call the first wave. These are very often built on older larva, uh, and they usually end up with poorer queen cells and poorer, poorer queens. This is why I think um, emergency cells have a reputation. A, a bad reputation, and I call these panic cells rather than emergency cells. Um, now, that will probably get shot down, but please, please, please try it, because I think you'll find the same as I did. And how this stuff keeps going, I, 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 I really don't know. Now, we get our emergency cells, so uh, you can manage that, and you can get some cracking queens from emergency cells, I promise you. Okay, you can get some poor ones, but so you can with any other form of queen, uh, queen Mary. <clears throat> Simple. So deep queen, one of your group A colonies, so one of your good ones. So you, you take the queen away. Don't, don't cull her, look after her, because she's so good that you want to um, Use her to improve your bees. So what you can do is requeen one of your bee colonies or make up a nucleus with her. 
Um, immediately you've got a benefit straight away. Okay? And uh, if you want to go to a quick introduction, Carl's got some booklets at the back of you. Sold them all yet? Uh, they've gone. They've all gone. <sighs> right, what will happen is you take the coin away, the, the bees will build queen cells on worker larva, so you will end up with emergency cells. Don't cut them out for seven to nine days. Don't, don't cut them out, otherwise um, you'll end up with the problems that we, uh, we, we, we know about. Then, if you only want one, reduce the one. If you want them for uh, some, something else, uh, other colonies, distribute them. Either amongst um, uh, your own colonies or other beekeepers. And that is a nice, easy way of doing it. I once heard of a, a commercial beekeeper who had um, 500 colonies of bees, and uh, that is his only method of queen bearing. And um, I understand from uh, people in the locality, it's a really good piece. So it, it can work. That's a nice easy way of doing it. You don't need any um, grafting or anything like that, because um, the, the bees are doing it. Now, small control methods. Um, most of them, um, you can have surface screen cells. Uh, some methods you can use for increased tools, such as the artificial swarm. Uh, I have to say I've never ever used artificial swarm myself for um, uh, the purposes it was intended. I have for, in a modified version, something else. But it's a method that's um, very often taught. Most beekeepers know it, so um, uh, we'll, we'll go along with it. There are some other methods where you use a, a board and an extra brood box. Um, and three names that come to my mind are Snellgrove, Horsey and Demery. There are variations on those. Um, they don't work for everybody, but if you're understanding what's happening inside the colony, uh, then they should work um, reasonably efficiently. So you end up with a board um, there, so you've got the bottom brood chamber, which uh, is usually a new comb, supers above, then the board, and then the old brood chamber above. I can't go through it um, uh, through today, but the basic principles of all of them are exactly the same. There's lots of benefits um, with, um, uh, with that too. Um, you end up with bees and queens usually in the top box. Um, very suitable for small apiaries too. Not great if you've got out apiary or, or, or big numbers, but with those you end up with um, uh, with, uh, with new, new comb as well. Here's a very successful apiary I, I came across. I think there were 14 colonies uh, there altogether. You can see struck away as an experienced beekeeper that apart from the one on the, on the left, which might have been a new, but I don't know, they all look very, very similar. <laughs> and if you go into a, uh, an apiary and you see hives all over the place, um, the beekeeping is perhaps not going to be as efficient as if they're all very, very uh, uh, similar. This beak uh, used the snow growth uh, system and uh, there's one of the entrances open there. If you look carefully at all the others, you'll see that's what he did. All summer, whether the bees um, were showing signs of swarming or not, that's what he did. And um, he did really well at it. He got 14 colonies uh, of bees, all in that stuff jumped by the high, so bigger than uh, of use and probably bigger than most of you folk. He had native or near, near native bees, they were pretty close to being native, and everything uh, was on snail grow boards, and, 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 and there still were fairly small colonies. Certainly, all the full colonies were on snail grow boards, and you got a really good crop of honey, and you were consistent. And this year, which was not last year before, um, I think you got 1,200 pounds on 14 colonies. Uh, change colour which um, I mentioned. Now the great thing about it is he had the opportunity to cull his poor queens and his bees were really, really good. So 
small, simple things like that could be done by um, uh, by all big people. Now for the more advanced, those who want perhaps more queens, um, either on your own or individuals working uh, together, so as an, as an organised uh, group, perhaps speaking an association. In that case, you may need what I call artificial queen rearing. So what is artificial queen rearing? I've never seen a definition, so I made one up. To encourage bees to convert a worker larva into a queen by manipulating the larva all the cell the egg was laid in, then presenting to the colony that's in a condition to build it into a queen cell. And I can't think of anything simpler than that. If anyone can come and speak to me afterwards. The advantages of this are you can get greater number of queen cells uh, raised. So you can do almost as many as you, you, you like really. The great thing is that within um, a little bit, you know the age of them. So within, uh, within perhaps half a day, you know the age of them, so you know when they should be emerging. And you can plan things in advance. Which you can't always do with, um, with swarm cells, because swarm cells can be... Uh, the queen can lay stagger over perhaps six, sometimes seven days. So now, all of a sudden, the timing can suit you. So instead of the bees deciding to do um, queen cells two days before you go on two weeks holiday in June, um, you, can, uh, you can start two days after you come back. So you get more control. Here are some artificial methods. Um, uh, and I'll just put these up almost at random. The cell punch cutting comb, which I'm going to go through the miller, and larval transfer, which you folk will probably know as grafting, and the cell uh, plug, which will be known generically as um, gentle or cut kit. I'm just briefly going to do these. With the uh, cell punch, you just get a tube, you take a frame with the other end of the O's you want, you literally punch out the, um, uh, the cell um, and then uh, mount it. And in fact, somebody here has uh, made some and I'm sure they'll be happy to uh, show you at break time. So you end up with, um, you can put them in a, you put, put them in like that, and you end up with some, um, uh, with queen cells like that. And they're pretty good queen cells to make. <coughs> um, there is going to be a book out soon on punching, where I can um, finally get around to get a publisher for it. Now, the middle method is, um, uh, is a very simple method. You get a comb, and it could be the comb that you've um, uh, got in your, um, uh, uh, you know, if you've had drawn out above the, um, uh, above the queen excluder. Um, and what you do is you, you cut it into a shape. This W shape that everyone loves is actually quite, uh, quite easy. Um, and then you get the queen to lay in it, and then you cut back the comb to the larva of the right age. They then put uh, queen cells on the edge as they started to do here. And then larval transfer, which you know is grafting, where you take a, um, a, an artificial cup. I prefer the plastic ones like that rather than wax ones, so an awful lot easier. But all you do is take the larva out of a comb, put it in these little cuts and let the bees get on with it. It's, it's, it really is quite simple. Uh, and then you end up with um, a queen cells like that. And then finally there's the, um, uh, the general cup kit, which is a little plastic box. It replicates a comb. That's got holes in that the queen seems to think are cells. Behind the cells are uh, little plugs which are effectively the base of the cell. So when the queen lays in, um, sorry, you, 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 put, you put the queen in the box, you retain her in there with that queen excluder, shoot it up, and um, uh, when the eggs hatch into larva, you take those, put them in a little holder, and you end up with some, um, I might have some here, 
got some of that, you end up with some uh, quick sales like that. Now, these methods are probably pretty good for a local beekeeping association, so you get 10, 20, 30 quick sales quite easily. But the choice is yours, it doesn't matter what you use. Um, they are different ways of achieving the same thing. There's a lot more. The reason I've mentioned those is that with the, um, uh, with the cell punch, it will punch the, um, uh, the, the, uh, the cell with the lava in. So you're not actually touching the lava. Um, the Miller method, you're encouraging the queen to lay the comb and then cutting back to lava at the right age. Level transfer, you're taking the uh, lava out and putting it in the cup. And with, with, the, uh, with the cup kit, you're encouraging the queen to think that she's laying in the comb. You then take the, the, the base of the comb, and, uh, or the base of the cell rather, and um, uh, uh, put that in the holder. They all work. So you use what suits you. Um, it really doesn't matter. Um, there's not that much cost to any of them really. But what I suggest you do is get proficient with one and then try another. Don't just fiddle around with one, um, then fiddle around with another, then fiddle around with another, because I think you'll just get a bit despondent. Now we need to raise queen cells from the um, lava that we've got. So how can we do it? You need to remember how the bees are going to do it. There are three options, swarming, emergency and procedure. So, swarming and procedure are very difficult to um, replicate uh, simply. So we're left with emergency, which is nice and easy, because all that is basically is just taking the queen away from the colony, so we end up with the queen as colony. So all we can do then is copy them. So here we are, you get a, a nice strong colony, um, take one frame out, so that we can put our, our frame in. It not, needs to be a nice strong colony. And when I say strong, it needs to be bursting in bees. Not just bowling on 10 or 11 frames. It needs to be bursting in bees. So you hold the frame up and you can hardly see the bird underneath. So you need plenty of bees. Colony must be prosperous. It needs to have plenty of grub. Um, and uh, plenty of pollen especially. But just because it's got food doesn't mean to say that it's necessarily going to be good at um, um, uh, producing queen cells because of course what we try to do is get the young bees to produce the brood food. Now in my experience bees don't like uncapping um, a sealed brood, a uh, sealed food rather. Um, if it's either food that's or it's, um, or it's unsealed, uh, or perhaps feed, which I don't particularly like doing, um, they, uh, they, they seem to produce a lot more uh, brood food under those conditions. Now, it could be a group B colony. Um, and it could also be a honey producing colony too. So what better with one of your poorer colonies than to requeen it, um, get it producing um, uh, queens for you, and producing honey as well. So you can have an unproductive, uh, uh, sorry, a productive um, uh, one of your poorer colonies. <laughs> I suggest very strongly that you mark the, the, the top of the bars and what you've got there. I, I've been wrong uh, on many occasions and uh, uh, taken the wrong frame out. Now we've got that way cells, we need to distribute them. So the receptive colony must always be queenless. There are occasions when perhaps um, uh, you can put a queen cell in a queen mark colony, but we're not dealing with that at the moment. So you need to leave them several hours so they realise their queenless or protect the queen cell. And I'm sure you all know how to how to do that. You may well have emergency cells, especially if you've taken queen cells away, so you need to cut them out first. And then, um, if you've got to get the frame, let's 
pepper a hole, that's the easy way to do it. If not, just make one. So just push your thumb into the uh, face of the comb. You've then got somewhere that you can put your quid cell in and um, hold it by the um, the uh, piece of comb at the back, not the quid cell itself, if you can help it. Um, and um, uh, that that I find nice and easy. So you need to get them mated in some sort of colony. I think a nucleus is as good as any for the ordinary beekeeper. Um, and I'll show you how to make a nucleus up in uh, a minute. There's several, several ways of doing it. Those makeshift stands, um, they're nice and easy, they're cheap. Um, you can use milk crates and all the rest of it, but remember milk crates belong to somebody. So unless you find them in a skip, um, then um, uh, you know, they, 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 they do belong to the dairy or, or, or whatever. So please don't go pigeon milk crates just for the sake of it. This is the Queen Mary section at the bottom end of the Whisper Green um, uh, teaching apiary. You can see the um, the main colonies in the back. We've got the um, Queen Mary section right down at the bottom, out of the way. Try to get entrances facing different directions if you can, because very often you're getting um, queens coming back from mating or orientation flights at the same time. When they're out, um, bees are fanning at the entrance, and if they're all facing the same way, there is an outside chance that they'll come back to the wrong one. And of course, if they come back to the wrong one, they'll get sorted. Try to put them in shade, because uh, nukes, um, especially, are very, um, very vulnerable to changing uh, temperature. So if, you, if you've got them in, in sun, um, they can struggle to ventilate them. That then puts them under pressure, um, uh, under stress rather. If you put them under stress, you then open them up for possible uh, disease uh, issues. Keep them away from colonies too, because um, if you handle a colony, um, a big colony, go and have a look half an hour or so later and you'll still see fanning bees at the entrance. If you've got a big colony here and a colony where a, a, a queen is likely to come back from a mating flight there, she comes back to her home, this colony is fanning more than that one and she could well go into the wrong one um, uh, to be slaughtered. So try and keep them away from four colonies if you possibly can. I know with some teaching apiaries, um, even some apiaries, it's not particularly easy, um, but there are other things you can do. One of which is, um, I suggest not inspecting uh, queens a lot if you're going on mating flights between perhaps 10 o'clock in the morning and 6 o'clock at night. I know that's what, what, um, what we're told, but um, uh, let's not put trip wires in. We are producing some really good queens, or hopefully some really good queens, and we don't want to, um, uh, to jeopardise that in any way. So, problems raising queens in. Some queen cells uh, don't emerge. You tend to get a black mush inside, or perhaps a queen not develop. I suspect that would be one of the viruses. Um, that's, uh, that takes me out of the depth. But obviously, black queen cell virus is a mushy one. But why some of the others get to a certain stage and then don't develop anymore, uh, I don't know. They don't return from mating flights. Um, it's surprising the number that emerge with deformed wings. Surprising. Um, and uh, another thing, of course, can be beekeeper uh, induced. So what I suggest you do is um, check um, within about three days of the queen emerging, have a look in the colony, have a look for a virgin queen. If you see with all the wings, just close up and leave it. If she's got deformed wings, she will never ever go out mating. All she do is just come out, end up on the ground and be predated on. That's all, she won't even hive. So um, make sure that you um, 
uh, you check if you possibly can. Don't think it takes about four days for the section that mature to go out on their orientation uh, flights. So if you leave her that length of time, of course, you could be looking when she's going out on a flight. Um, some don't get uh, mated at all. Um, the cold weather is very often uh, are blamed. Um, it might be that, or perhaps um, there's something wrong uh, with the queen. And even last year, in good weather, sometimes it took queens uh, four, five, six weeks even to get mated. Now I know we usually told that three weeks and they more than three weeks and they, and they won't. Um, I can tell you that they, 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 they do. So whatever it is, don't get put off. Just because there are problems, I can assure you that other people are having problems as well. Um, let's just try to do the best of what we've got.